Welcome very much to my panel. Thank you for the introductions. Um, just quickly to introduce my panelists, we have, and I apologize if I get any of the pronunciations wrong, we have Eva Halverson <laughs> from AP2. We have Hiro Mizuna from GPIF. We have Stefan Horta from Allianz. We have Michael Schmidt from DECA. And we have Tycho Sch Sch Schneil Schneis? Schneiders. Schneiders. Schneiders from LGT. And I guess I should just do a big plug, because you've got some adverts sitting around for the, uh, for the board nomination. So this is your man. So I'm Helene Winch from HSBC, as introduced. The structure of the session that we're going to run for the next hour is I'm going to have got three questions for the panelists. Then I'm going to open it up to all of you to ask your burning questions. So please think about those now. And then we'll come back for a summary. So what I wanted to start with is continuing on this theme of um, the, the role and the tone from the top. And all of you are leading PRI signatories and senior executives of your organizations. What I'd like to know really is, what does it mean for you to integrate ESG effectively inside your, your organizations? How do you approach this? How do you frame ESG at the highest level? And how do you demonstrate this commitment at the board level and with stakeholders? So maybe, may I start with you? OK, thank you. Uh, I must start by apologizing apologizing for my voice. If it's a bit weak sometimes, it's because of the flu, not because I had a super fantastic evening yesterday, which I hope <laughs> most of you had. Well, uh, for us at AP2, it's um, very much a question of having a strategy that takes these issues all through the organization. Uh, by saying that, I mean that we, in our overall strategy, uh, we have investment beliefs that talk about sustainability as, an, uh, of course, we take them into account here. And <coughs> to be able to be successful, you have to have commitment from the top, as uh, just was mentioned here. And I would say that we are very lucky to have that. At every board meeting, every management meeting, a lot of uh, meetings with our staff. And it's not just about the commitment from the top. As important is the commitment from uh, all of the organization from the bottom. So uh, commitment is important and also culture. Um, to put it short, uh, this is part of our DNA at AP2. Everyone is engaged uh, in these issues and very much of what we do is driven from uh, our colleagues. It could come from anyone. It doesn't have to do with what your title is or something like that. Uh, I'm a strong believer of that this should come from within. It's not a, this is not issues for an ESG uh, department. Fantastic. Stefan. Yes, uh, thanks for the question, Helen. Um, I'd like to echo that for me personally, it is very important and I'm very grateful that I have the full commitment of our, of Allianz Global Investors Global Executive Committee on ESG. And uh, even one step further up, I'm very grateful that we have a very credible parent with Allianz SE, a leading ESG insurance company. So that is a good start and it needs to come from the top. Um, from an investment perspective, I think one of the key success factors clearly is what you, what you mentioned, I'd like to echo that, is a strong ESG investment belief and ESG conviction. Um, I think without that, that's how the world, the investment world works, with, in my view, with views and beliefs, even though there is a lot of uh, quant and, and mathematics involved these days. Um, Having said that, I find for successful ESG integration in our company, I'd also like to echo it goes from the top to the bottom. So it goes from the top management to all through our investment teams. We manage roughly 500 billion of assets. We are an active asset manager. We offer different asset classes, so equities, fixed income, multi-asset <coughs> alternatives. So you got to know what the frame of investing is for these teams and how they work. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Um, 
It also goes down to the client-facing uh, staff of ours. So ESG integration for me means that we establish a consistent speak to our clients and our ESG offering. Uh, plus, we are able to provide ESG investment advisory. So if necessary, guide our clients proactively, but also answer a specific question. That makes us credible. Um, last word on successful ESG integration. Going back to the investment side, you need to understand that, uh, of course, many portfolio managers are working in a set framework within their investment strategies. Um, to promote ESG, I'd like to mention two things. First of all, uh, of course, there's an element of changing mindset. Most of them grew up with a finance curriculum with modern uh, portfolio theory, learning about capital asset pricing model, Markowitz, and so on. Back then, for many, ESG was not part of the curriculum. So changing mindset means education. So we are investing a lot in learning tools. So we've just built a new e-learning tool on ESG for our investment professionals, but also for our client-facing staff and, of course, on-site training. Plus, we refer, of course, to great training like from PRI or the ESG module from CFA. Hero, I hear your situation slightly differently because you have to outsource 100% mm -hmm. of your investment. So how, I guess, <coughs> do you think about this and achieve effective ESG integration when you're delegating this to your managers? Well, thank you. <coughs> I think the uh, GPIF's journey for ESG integration and sustainable investment started about three years ago, uh, which was prompted by Japanese FSA introduced a uh, Japanese version of stewardship court. So the, uh, we actually is prompted by a regulator to pay more attention to stewardship activity with related to, in relationship to a G aspect of our investment. But the, what came to our mind at that time is, is G is really enough to make sure our portfolio is sustainable for long term. As we manage 1.3 US trillion dollar worth of uh, asset for Japanese you know, general public, and that we are designed as a part of a 100-year sustainable public pension scheme with the 25-year investment horizon. So uh, a lot of resource was spent on trying to find a good manager who can deliver some alpha, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make any difference to our long-term performance. So we came to realize we have to make sure for our performance to be sustainable for longer term, as long as like 25 years, whole portfolio or the financial system they operate has to be sustainable. So we just are trying to just promote that the uh, uh, stewardship core to include that the R integration of E and G is E and S factors in, uh, you know, to, uh, to our stewardship activities. So coming back to your question about how we achieve it, because we don't do any in-house investment other than domestic fixed income. So we have a 100% outsourcing model. So our ESG integration can be only achieved by making sure it's consistently integrated through the investment chain. <coughs> so on one side, we try to work hard internally to take ESG into uh, our asset manager evaluation. So uh, one unique uh, you know, the, uh, challenge we made over the last two years, we have been urging our passive manager to step up as an active steward, because they actually own a lion's share of our voting power. And uh, unlike active manager, they probably ended up holding our money almost forever. Well, they, we may change managers, but you know, as a whole, our money will reside in a passive index for almost forever. So uh, we just need to make sure that the passive manager understand that their business have to take ESG into, in, in, into their uh, business uh, activities. And uh, we probably the one of very few or one of first asset owner actually changed the, our mandate to the passive manager based upon their ESG or stewardship, you know, the quality of their activities. So uh, that's one thing we do. And uh, given our non-direct shareholding of the corporations, we are not in the direct sort of in a tense relationship with the corporations. So now we are trying to hear more from corporations what they want us to convey to asset manager 
or they appear as their owner outside of Japan, or how they want to see Japanese companies. So uh, we are promoting ESG uh, integration into their business strategy at the corporate level. Uh, so we recently introduced the new ESG indices, and we promoted the, the how they should communicate with ESG researcher. And that's the one attempt to make sure the company level they take either ESC into, uh, into their business strategy. So coming back to my initial point, it is very important for us, particularly the one who doesn't have you know, in-house investment strategy, to make sure to affect the whole investment system, you know, the chain becomes more sustainable by taking ESG into their business, you know, their daily operation. Thank you, and we very much appreciate your leadership in this, so thank you very much. Um, Michael, would you like to talk a bit about how Decker thinks about this? Well, um, I would make three points. Um, integration of ESG in a larger asset manager as we are. We are one of the top four asset managers in Germany. Um, and we have a range of asset classes that we uh, invest in and different clients. Um, it's, it starts with awareness. Uh, awareness on all levels across the organization. And certainly signing the PRI has helped accelerate the process. Um, it is also the encouragement of education and training, which I find important here. And um, uh, we encourage, uh, for example, people to, to um, take programs like this, FS certified um, um, ESG analyst, or um, we've got one person who's uh, writing a thesis. Um, so I think encourage, encouragement um, is of education is, is important as to create the awareness. Then, uh, this awareness needs for, for it to be applied in, in daily business, you need data. You need um, good data, uh, the right data, and that's been evolving over time, I think. We, we have no perfect data at the moment. Um, and we need, of course, the interpretation of that data. Um, just having a database does not help. Um, you have to interpret it. That's why we need, that's why we have um, ESG specialists as a core team. Um, and also, um, that's why we engage in dialogue with companies um, whose data we, we get, basically, or assessments we get from, from external providers. Thirdly, however, um, all that is good and well if, um, if only it needs to be implemented in daily decision making um, across those asset classes and clients that we have. So um, for that, we've created a, a network of experts um, which goes across um, <coughs> client relationships goes across portfolio management, asset um, uh, classes, investment styles, um, to effectuate a tailored implementation rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, but tailored to what is required in a, in a bond context, in an equity context, in a multi-asset context. Thank you. And Tycho, lastly, but, but by no means least, um, can you explain how, how you think about things at the top level and how you assure that um, ESG is effectively integrated? I think for me it's very important to establish a holistic ESG approach. ESG should not be something that only pertains to a part of the portfolio. So I think it's really key that ESG decision making is part of every investment decision a firm like ours makes. And I think to make that happen, you can't have ESG as a separate process managed by a separate team. It shouldn't be a team in the far dark corner of the office. It should really be part <laughs> of the responsibilities of everyone who is involved in the investment process. It's fine to have specialists who are more dedicated to certain aspects, but you cannot take ESG responsibilities away from, um, from any investment professional. I think that's one element. Second, I think there is a difference if you are an investment manager versus an asset owner. As, it, as, an, as, an, as, it, um, as an asset owner, you can have your own ethical framework in which your ESG vision um, fits and you can determine that as an asset manager, you have the complexity that obviously you have probably a view of your firm, but you also have views of your clients and your clients have different ethical frameworks and we see that. And that, of course, adds an additional complexity in how to manage ESG portfolios. And I would say a third element um, really has to do with, with the fact that getting buy-in from the top is often difficult because you, you often hear people saying, 
yes, we are all in favor of doing ESG, but really having them incorporating it into their own daily responsibilities, into their own whatever budgeting, into their own decision making, is often much more difficult than just getting the superficial buy-in, because in today's world, who would say that they are not in favor of incorporating ESG into um, investment decisions? I like that um, kind of not having the ESG person sitting <coughs> in the cupboard, and I guess that follows in from this expertise that a lot of people have in this room and actually interpreting this increasing amount of ESG data that we're all seeing. Um, I think following on from that, and Hero, we heard a little bit from you there about how you're encouraged by your, your regulator to look at this. And I wanted to ask the rest of the panel, really, what was your motivation to look at this? Was it um, the carrot or the stick? Or, as we heard earlier from Nicholas, avoiding the dead turkey. That's going to be a, um, a tweet there somewhere on that. Um, or was it a, just a pure commercial opportunity? You thought you'd sell more funds if you put ESG in it. Um, so maybe, um, Stefan, maybe can we start with you about kind of what was the motivation from the top two to do this? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, certainly uh, it's a combination of different points. Um, first of all, we're a client-centric company, so we want to meet our clients' investment objectives as good as it gets. Um, and uh, clearly, most of our clients uh, have one target. It's investment performance, performance, and performance, right? <laughs> but increasingly, of course, our clients are asking questions, and I'm talking about what we would call uh, mainstream clients, yeah? Uh, questions about... Uh, how about ESG integration and how can you improve our investment outcome uh, with an additional ESG perspective? So, of course, as an active asset manager, we want to innovate and use that as an impulse for innovation. Uh, if you look at innovation in asset management in the last years, it was mostly with technical financial instruments, derivatives, using derivatives, building structured products, and it is still to some degree. Uh, we think ESG is a great source of innovation and also to build a USP for our client. And as, a, as an active asset manager, uh, we think we are in a very good position mm. to unleash the full potential of ESG integration to the benefit of our client's uh, investment performance and portfolio outcomes. So as I said, like uh, a combination of things, innovation and client interest, client demand, uh, not really by a fear, uh, a fear of not meeting regulations, even though that now plays part. So we are one of the leading foreign asset managers in France. So um, personally, I was involved with my team and many others within our organization to build those French uh, um, um, regulatory reports to make our institutional clients in France comply with this French law. Section 173, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that, of course, is important that we make our clients comply with that law. Um, but uh, after all, I think it's about uh, uh, delivering better investment outcomes within uh, understanding, fully understanding our clients' investment objectives. I really like that point about innovation. I think if we can all think that we're part <coughs> of innovation, that, would, that makes everything sound so much more exciting. Hero, do you want to add a little bit more about how that pressure from the regulator came about? And, and I guess looking forward, is there going to be more pressure for you to do things additionally? I never feel pressure from regulator. I put a pressure on regulator usually. So. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So the, in a, the re <laughs> recent revision of a stewardship court, we urge them to have an ESG in the stewardship court. So I think the, uh, you know, the Japanese stewardship court always regarded as a sort of a copy of the UK stewardship court, but in the field of ESG, I think the uh, Japanese stewardship court is ahead of US case stewardship court. To give a credit, I think somebody from FSA in the audience. Um, <coughs> but the, the way we try to just uh, communicate with the uh, uh, asset manager is, in our stewardship activity principle or guideline to asset manager, we made it very clear, we, we expect our asset manager to become a signatory of PRI or explain why they no, don't need to. So that's the first step. And the second step is we say like we believe in the 
ESG integration, and we expect the, all the asset managers to integrate ESG into their investment decision. And the third one is we urge the asset managers to engage with the company for significant ESG matters. So we made those three very explicit statements in our guideline to the asset managers. So I believe that uh, the asset <coughs> manager feels enough, you know, the urge from us. And at the same time, actually, I've been asking the question to the asset managers if they would accept the money from the asset owner who don't believe in those values. That's an interesting question, and we haven't got the very categorical answer yet. Okay, we'll have that panel in <laughs> And that's Francisco. a corporate integrity issue, in my opinion, but you know, I'll leave it to that question to the, my peer panelists. But <laughs> 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 I think we are giving a very uh, enough, I mean, explicit enough message to the asset manager through our you know, the investment chain. Absolutely. Um, Michael, I believe your, your, some of your encouragement and incentives comes from the, your ownership structure, is that right? Yes, I think it's, um, well, I should probably explain um, what, the, what this means. Uh, DECA Investment is part of DECA Group, which is again part of the savings banks um, network in Germany. And um, of course that means it's a decentralized uh, structure that the um, uh, banks, um, the Sparkassen and savings banks have. So very much um, rooted in their communities, um, in their regions. Um, so they are, have always been forced um, to actually take a stakeholder uh, approach uh, because they immediately get feedback in the <laughs> regions, whatever they do. So I think th that makes it clear that um, we should also, as a, as, as, as a service um, provider to, uh, saying to the savings banks in Germany, we should also um, you know, follow that, that logic. And therefore, it is uh, a natural um, instinct in a way. But it has to do with reputation as well. And I think reputation is a, is a big driver of it and has become a much bigger driver, driver for many um, over the last, last years. And um, that, but, but that's not the only one. So reputation is, is certainly important. Um, another one is a regulatory anticipation. What do I mean? It means we ought to take into account for our mutual funds what regulations coming down to us, and we rather anticipate it. Um, but more importantly, um, anticipating regulation um, in this field of sustainability is, um, is, a, is a feature towards our institutional clients. Because institutional clients will be faced with uh, things like uh, the um, they have been faced with the CSR directive, with the, they'll have the pension fund directive, there will be the shelters rights directive. And with, from my work in the um, high level expert group of the EU Commission, I know there's probably coming a bit more, um, um, not necessarily new regulation, but adaptations. Um, but thirdly, I think the most important point to do sustainability is really um, it helps risk management. It should help risk management, and therefore it has a clear benefit on um, what we ought to achieve for our clients, for our um, asset owners. Tycho, I mean, you, you, you um, have an asset management business which goes across many asset classes as well. Can you maybe um, not only discuss about kind of your, the pressure you feel from the top to integrate ESG, but also how that manifests itself across maybe some of the other asset classes mm -hmm. um, that you manage? Yeah, I think it's not really pressure that led us to incorporate ESG. Our ESG journey started a long time ago, really in 2002, before there was any discussion of, of regulators um, putting pressure to incorporate sustainability um, topics. So w with us, it was really three different elements that came together. On the one hand, it also goes back to our ownership. So LGT is a, a bit rare in the financial mm -hmm. services, but we are a family-owned business. So it's a single family that owns LGT. And our family has for a long time been involved in sustainability, philanthropy, charity. So for the family, it has always been a very big um, topic. And if you think about where sustainability goes back to, it goes back often to forestry. The family has big forests and you can't cut down more trees than you grow. So that has been very much ingrained in the, uh, in the, um, in the thinking of the family. Secondly, we work for a large number of, of Nordic clients. I mean, the AP system is our largest client as a group. And um, in Sweden, 
sustainability and ESG has been also already in 2001 and 2002 were already big topics. And as, yes, we, we had the APC as a message, a big client, we all early on started discussing about how to incorporate ESG and sustainability in some of the portfolios, um, in those days private equity portfolios that we were managing for the APs. And then I would say thirdly, also from us as a management team, there was a clear desire to, to do the right thing and to really take this on and embed it as much as possible into our various asset classes. And that then maybe leads me to the, <coughs> to the second part of your question. I think we found a fairly good way of incorporating and integrating ESG across various asset classes, whether they are private market asset classes, where you have, of course, illiquidity as a special topic, the liquid alternatives, and particularly hedge funds is a, is, is a special topic. We just had a very interesting panel before um, this session. And then you have also more of the multi-asset and long-only portfolios. And we've set up a, I'd say, a governance structure where we have one ESG committee across asset classes and one ESG committee per asset category. And I have to say that has worked out very well. There are certain overall topics, vision, strategy that are discussed at this top body. But you also need to have the time and the people who really want to go in depth on ESG topics within the asset class. And so about five years ago, we set up what we call these sub ESG committees with dedicated members in each of those. And what that allows is on the one hand, you do go into the details of ESG topics per asset class, but you also learn from each other. And for example, on private equity, one of the issues that you have is if you have a big private equity portfolio, we have about 7,000 companies, how do you monitor ESG compliance of 7,000 underlying companies? And in the end, what we did was copy our colleagues on the listed equity side. They used a service called RepRisk, where they got information um, around ESG <coughs> controversies of each single equity holding that they had. What we did was basically we uploaded our privately held company database, eh, all, all the privately held companies that we have in our private equity portfolio, onto the RepRisk database to get interesting monitoring information on each of those 7,000 companies, which would otherwise be impossible. So I think that infrastructure has allowed us also to really learn from each other because incorporating ESG in private equity versus listed equities is a completely different process. And I think I was on the hedge fund session as well. And I think actually maybe there's more similarities between integrating ESG across the asset classes than, than differences sometimes. And at the end of the day, the bonds are the bonds of the listed equity companies and private equity companies become listed or, or kind of the other way around. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting way of doing it and applying different methodologies. Um, Eva, we, we listened to your minister yesterday and he was wonderful. And I loved his comment about instead of it being good for the planet and good for returns, we're now flipping it around and it's good for returns, oh, and good for the planet. So how do you think about, or how do you integrate um, the desires of the, of the government and how do you kind of work together on kind of achieving what they want you to achieve or are you completely separate to what their desires and you just happen to come to the same wonderful place? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody who heard him yesterday could hear that he's very engaged uh, in this asset. And this has been part of our objective ever since the AP funds were founded 17 years ago. But I, I'm sure I talk both for me and my colleagues at the other funds that we don't see this as a stick. It's much more uh, encouraging then it could be, of course, a, a challenge to, to s make sure that we are talking about the same uh, things, that, that the wishes uh, from the minister comes true. But I see it. You asked earlier, why did we, why do, we do this? Well, uh, a lot of wise things have been said, but there's actually no rocket science. The one, I always keep saying this at home at the office, the one that has the most and best information, can take the best investment decision. It's not harder than that. And I think uh, the challenge is to understand that you need new kind of information. And that's um, something going back to the culture of the organization to know one of our 
most important values at AP2 is uh, constant improvement. And if we want to constant improve ourselves and be world class in everything we do, we have to learn a lot of new things. And that is also encouraging for us. It's, it's not depressing to know that there is so much we don't know, but it's very much encouraging. And that is something that you can apply on uh, working with ESG at the point where we are right now, I would say. And uh, yeah. Sounds like your journey's got a long way to go oh still, yeah. which, is, which is wonderful to hear. We'll be interviewing you in 10 years' time, still on the same subject, I'm sure. Um, mm. Before we open up for questions, we're just going to talk a bit more about integrating ESG across other asset classes beyond just the investment into equities. Um, it's something that I think is very important. We spend way too much time talking about equities. Um, and actually here, I don't know if I can kind of come to you on this because mm -hmm. you've got quite a bond heavy portfolio <coughs> as I understand it. And yeah. I just wondered whether how much you've thought about the ESG factors in your bonds. I guess you must have corporate and government bond portfolios. Sure. Um, we started with equities as the other people. You know, the, uh, that's where particularly like, a, you know, a stewardship court activity related to G started. But I actually don't, see, don't think there's any option for GPF not to integrate ESG into all asset classes we invest in. Because when we talk about the negative externality of the corporate activities, it actually doesn't sound to me very natural that the, uh, the let's say company A produce a lot of pollutions, that cost will be you know, observed by the other private business. It's actually very difficult for me to agree, you know, to expect that and assume that. I think more of those, you know, even the pollution may create the business for the other companies, but that cost has to be, you know, uh, taken by public. And uh, so uh, if we invest, when we invest into the sovereign, you know, the bonds, I think the ESG factor should be a part of it. So, uh, you know, all the other theme of uh, ESG or negative uh, externality or minimizing ex externality is uh, all about the holistic view we may have to have over different asset classes. So, you know, we are now starting our alternative investment with a real estate and private equity and infrastructure. And we find it actually much easier for us to integrate ESG uh, with those asset classes because that's a new asset class for us. I found it much more difficult to change the people's mindset in traditional asset classes because they have been working in their own way. And we should respect that. They are hardcore investment professional working with numbers and those the way they wanted to work for the last you know, 20, 30 years. So uh, we are just sending a message. We have no discrimination you know, over any asset classes. We will try to integrate the ESG into every single investment we make regardless of <coughs> asset class and regardless of geography too. And Stefan, maybe kind of just come to you because Allianz is very kind of well known for having big infrastructure book and other asset classes. How does your approach compare to some of the other panelists about how you think about ESG, kind of where you get the data from, um, different approaches? And do you find it easier in the new asset classes as well, same as Hero? Let me go one step back. Um, so what we do on our research side is um, we make our ESG research available through a global research platform. And uh, we have a very fine ESG research team, but our approach is similar uh, to what Tycho said. We believe everybody on our investment platform, every portfolio manager, every fundamental research colleague uh, should participate uh, uh, in the review of that ESG research, uh, support it by the expertise of our ESG research team. Um, that research is made available to all of our investment professionals. So it doesn't matter whether they are managing equities or fixed income or multi-asset or, or alternatives. Um, ultimately, one of our new innovations views is to focus on tail risk of uh, corporate issuers um, because we find in <coughs> particular for concentrated equity strategies where you pick say between 30 and 70 holdings, um, you uh, cannot afford and what, take my word, uh, maybe a bit too uh, non-professional ESG torpedo. So a company that uh, really does dive is from a share, share price perspective and then um, kills performance. So we try to build up uh, that signal. Plus we make available, uh, again, our stewardship activities. So every 
portfolio manager, every research colleague is asked to uh, contribute to corporate engagement as a key means of uh, ESG integration. And we record it around which theme we uh, engage with the corporate, uh, and it can be many topics, plus, of course, our proxy voting strategy. Now, your question on asset classes. Um, the commonalities I find uh, where it doesn't matter which asset class is, you focus on a few, but what we call financially material ESG factors. Um, and uh, let me take corporate issuers. It doesn't matter whether you invest in the bond or equity, the issue remains the issue, right? Uh, so it's valid for both the fixed income manager and the equity manager. Um, for um, alternatives, uh, again, here ESG is as important, but the way it's processed into the investment process is a bit different because you typically, if you go into private market investment, you're locked in for some time, so you better do a good ESG risk dil diligence upfront uh, when you source that project and analyze that mm -hmm. project. Um, short word uh, on, on corporate fixed income and severance, uh, we also think ESG integration into credit assessment is important, and especially for understanding that uh, sovereign bonds is the dominant asset mm -hmm. class, right? Um, and typically, uh, like a pension fund, like you have a long-term perspective and look at it as a safety asset, right? At, at least for developed um, yeah. uh, sovereigns. So safety uh, is got to be challenged with long-term ESG risk trends like climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we think it's important to match the yeah. two. And for credit uh, assets, it's more downside risk, whereas mm -hmm. for equities, you would also look at opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a broad brush, quick picture, how we approach it. Thank you. And, and Michael, I'm, when we had our, our call, you talked a bit about kind of the measurement of the impact that you do. And um, kind of obviously the ESG integration is one one part of the job, but the what comes out and what impact your portfolio has and making sure that that is a sensible impact. Maybe kind of, can you expand a bit about, um, about how you do that and what you're trying to achieve with that? Well, I think the, the ultimate test is um, a risk adjusted return, I'd say. Mm. Um, the question is over what time, because if we are right, I think we all agree that somehow risk management is is supported um, um, by ES integrating ESG, then it should show in risk-adjusted <laughs> returns. Um, so I think that we, we, we ought to uh, look at that. Um, uh, if we talk about sort of the, the other um, individual aspects, like the G factor governance, mm -hmm. one can more easily track the outcome because you know what you um, asked for and you know what you got. Um, so that's 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 something of impact measurement uh, on E and S, um, ecological and social. I I think we, we ought to advance quite a lot still, especially on on the social side. Um, it was mentioned this morning on the when we talked about SDG and Simpson I think said it, um, and on the ecological side. Well, we are most advanced in terms of data availability, carbon footprint, and the likes, but we haven't. Uh, designed yet, I think, measures as uh, overall as an industry, nor have we as a house, um, as to what we want to achieve in a couple of years' time, how many, how many reduction in, in, in CO2 levels or other measures. So I think there needs, there's still a lot uh, of work to do. Absolutely. Right, it's your time for questions. I hope you've been thinking for some good ones. And may I ask you to state your name and your organization and a clear Precise and short question, what please? But uh, Mike's this one over here. <coughs> Hi, uh, Linda Giuliano from Alliance Bernstein. Uh, thanks so much for the discussion. Um, my question is around the title, which talks about uh, long term sustainable returns. And the reality is most investors are still focused on short-term returns, uh, quarterly performance, et cetera. So my question is, what has to change in the mindset of investors to really start focusing on the long-term? Great question. So who wants to volunteer to answer? I will pick someone. OK, oh. thank you. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Yeah, please. Well, uh, I think that just by introducing new kinds of 
measurements or new information that you have to consider to be able to, to invest is a way to underline that uh, you have to look for the long term at your investments. And of course, I guess that most of us sitting here, we have a long term objective from our owners uh, to do that. And I, I would like to come back to that. We've heard a lot about the sustainable development goals here. And I think they are a perfect way to make us understand if we can relate what we're doing in our investment portfolio, as we have been doing. Uh, it's a great way to understand that we are all in this together uh, and we all have to do things uh, to make these goals uh, happen. I think that's a good link because, yes, yeah, sustainable development goals very much is a long term target. Hero, did you want to come in? Oh, yes. Um, we are totally aware, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the common uh, interest to sort of get rid of short termism out of investment chain. But the question is how we can do it. And the, we asked the asset manager the question how you are evaluated within your firm, <coughs> how your remuneration is set uh, in relationship to long-term performance. So we asked those questions to convey the message that the, uh, their, you know, the asset manager has to govern their own team to uh, reflect the, uh, the long-term uh, perspective of the asset owner. But the, in reality, what the problem is we review asset manager too frequently, and uh, we don't give you long-term commitment. And uh, when we ask the, uh, the, uh, you know, the corporate management to not to fall into short-termism, and, and also we ask asset managers not to make, have a short-term mindset to manage our money, we are, you know, the, we are always harassed when we produce our quarterly report. <laughs> So the, we cannot full-heartedly tell all that people in an investment chain to focus on the long term. So short term is actually not only at the company level, at the asset manager level, but also at the owner level. And uh, you know, there's some people in Norway tend to uh, disclose their performance on a daily basis. I really don't think that's sending a right message. So, but for the asset owner to reduce the frequency <laughs> of uh, the report, it's very challenging because they, a lot of people think it's going backwards in terms of transparency. So I always suggest that the, if the, all the asset managers can agree and sign up to communicate that we stop releasing their quarterly report. <laughs> and it may make the, uh, the ultimate impact on the investment chain. So somebody you know, agree to that the uh, proposal, just come to sign up to me. <laughs> <laughs> Taika, are you gonna sign that? Yeah, I, I wanted to add that one way of it is really changing the mindset. I mean, another yeah. way is also really changing the asset allocation because clearly private equity has some of these long-term characteristics that yeah. are truly embedded in the asset class. And I think when it comes to implementing the sustainable development agenda in the private sector, I mean, private equity has to be um, a key of that. Well, that's true. There are yeah, yeah. now private equity is not anymore. I mean, yeah, a small backroom asset class like it was in the 70s and the 80s. It has really become a multi-trillion-dollar asset class, mm -hmm. having full control over tens of thousands of companies. So, implementing the sustainable development agenda that way is much easier. There is, of course, a caveat, and that is that all these private equity managers need to be convinced that this is the right thing to do. And that's where engagement is key. And I think that's where, I mean, yeah, all of us have a very important role to play. And engagement can pay off. We see it in, in our own private equity portfolio. We have about 150 uh, private equity managers in our portfolio that we rate on an annual basis and engage with on an annual basis on ESG. And we have seen that um, in the last four years from about 27% of the managers who really incorporated ESG um, considerations in their work, that is nowadays 55%. Um, and in places like, like in Europe, it's, it's about 68%. So we really see that that engagement pays off and that can really make a difference in how the private sector embraces and um, really also succeeds in implementing some of the sustainable development goals. Okay. Is there any more questions for my wonderful panel? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, I can see someone waving at the back. <laughs> Good afternoon, Adam Kirkman from AMP Capital. 
Adam Kirkman from AMP Capital. My question is for Hero. Um, you talked about the importance that you're placing on your external managers around engagement. I'm wondering um, what sort of feedback loops is GPIF um, requesting from the managers about who and, and what they're engaging on in terms of topics? And also, are you seeing any changes in the way the managers are actually um, voting on certain topics? Uh, first of all, the, uh, the, to your second question, uh, we actually observed a lot of changes in the, uh, the behavior of Japanese asset managers when they voted this year. We have been urging the asset managers to make sure they have, you know, they have the best in class corporate governance. It's not only applicable to the Japanese asset manager, but <coughs> I think the, uh, the, the, all the asset manager who received the money from us has to have a best in class corporate governance so that they can have a serious dialogue with the portfolio companies. So we have been urging on uh, asset managers to, to improve their corporate governance. And the second is we have been urging them to make sure they have a structure which is even obvious from outside to prevent the conflict of interest. And uh, that has been our you know, the, uh, uh, commitment for the last two years. And uh, this year, we started seeing that the, uh, you know, some of the you know, asset managers in the big you know, mega financial group voted very you know, negatively uh, to the proposal made by their biggest clients. So uh, it's also you know, uh, attributable to uh, FSA's, you know, the pressure on the, uh, the asset manager to be more accountable. And the GPF sending the letter to all our asset managers to disclose their voting record together with three other big Japanese public pension funds, which I think accounts for like a 60, 70% of the other asset managers' business. So we have been urging them to make sure they are, they are accountable for their decision. We are not trying to dictate how they vote because the, an asset manager has much better resource than we do to make a more informed decision. But we want to make sure asset manager is in the, in the position to be able to make arm's length and also informed decision. So uh, that's what we have been fo focusing on. And that uh, we started getting a lot of uh, the positive uh, loop of information coming through. And we also consulted with their big asset owners like Eva to try to find out in any particular cases they have a trouble with. And uh, we are trying to use that as a case study to engage with the asset manager, how they, you know, how they judged or how we reached the conclusion how to vote. So uh, I think there's a lot of positive, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, reaction or the changes happening in as far as Japanese market is concerned, if that's a question from you. Thank you. So we've got six minutes and 50 seconds to go. Do I have last few questions, please, for my panel? There's one <laughs> over here. Um, hi, Alison Schneider from AIMCO. Thank you very much. Great panel. A uh, couple questions. Uh, you were talking about bespoke strategies for each asset class. So I'm assuming that there's um, asset class sustainability guidelines or, or something along those lines that you use. And I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, is your ability to integrate ESG across asset classes a function of how big your RI team is? And is there a sweet spot number, or are you uh, making sure that everybody on the asset class teams are basically ESG people, and the ESG people are finance people? Like, how do you how do you go about doing this? Thank you. Okay, interesting question, Tycho. Yeah, I'm how big is your ESG team? <laughs> happy to to address it. I think it's it's very much the latter part. I think you have to make sure that those ESG capabilities and ESG responsibilities are part of every member of your investment team, not just some kind of IRI team that, as I mentioned, sits somewhere in a dark corner of your office. Um, I think that is really, really crucial because it, it, it won't really work if you, if you don't get the buy-in of the people who are really making the investment decisions. That, of course, requires training, it requires engagement, it requires um, a lot of interaction with your investment staff but for me, it's very clear that is the right way to go and the other way is the wrong way to go. Yeah. I, I think when we talk about bespoke strategies, um, there is a step ahead before you ask, you know, are we 
doing it through a dedicated team or um, and we have a similar approach you know um, uh, first of all I think we'd like to show yeah. our clients or fully understand our clients investment objectives including ESG objectives so we have an under Understand act uh, philosophy as Allianz Global Investors. The understand piece is about the financial investment perspective, but also the ESG perspective. So make it practical. Uh, are as are you concerned as a client about uh, reputational risks? Are you concerned about ESG risks? Um, are you concerned about uh, different pieces which uh, are around ESG? So we have to understand that. The second piece is. Uh, advise our client on instruments how to put that into a strategy so this bespoke customized sometimes may not be necessary uh, because uh, we do already a lot of things as Allianz Global Investors and our competitors that we just have to uh, make public and disclose like corporate engagement right um, that doesn't need to be anything bespoke around it um, uh, the third thing is uh, translated it into the portfolio context so uh, and again advise our clients so we had a discussion about exclusions in many panels right uh, still like the gut reaction of many clients are uh, you know ESG is about exclusion lists uh, ethical <laughs> and cost performance so it, we'd like to advise a client no uh, it's different there are better options different instruments before you do a bespoke large-scale exclusion list on our portfolios uh, we'd like to uh, introduce you our other instruments or other approaches and see the benefits and the, the the cons of an exclusion list that you're looking back for that it's very subjective that it's diminishing investment opportunities and all that right um, and and the customization also needs to reflect what's what's the impact on the investment promise the financial investment promise yeah so that's a bit of our philosophy on, on customization Okay, Michael, did you want to comment on your approach on this? Well, I think that one has to take into account that one doesn't start uh, the company anew. So you can't just hire people who have fully um, understood and um, taken into on board ESG issues. So it's an evolu evolutionary process, I think, and it needs to go viral. Um, it needs to start from, from promoters that then have the experience and, and are committed and then you, you get anchor points in each of the teams and then, and then the, the message spreads. Um, and, and with that, you actually combine um, the ESG perspective, which is for some a new perspective for some, asset, for some portfolio managers, and you, you bring in the, um, asset ma the, the asset class or the investment style perspective at the same time, uh, because only then you match the two to get the long-term returns that we want to get and you have the tailored approach for your clients and for your, for your, for your funds. So I think one should take into account that the bigger the organization is, the more you have to also um, promote this viral infection, as it were, in, in a good way. Viral ESG, I like that. Um, we've got less than two minutes, so what I need from all of you along the panel, starting with Tycho, is um, what are your biggest challenges for this year um, and for sustainability and and for next year, I guess we're only in September. In a sentence. Very, qu very quick, two points. Um, what gets measured gets managed, was mentioned before. So I think the lack of availability of standardized data and KPIs is still an issue. And I would say secondly, we see it very clearly in, in, in alternative assets. The US managers are lagging. So I would say, I would ask for, I mean, all the US-based asset owners, please push your US managers to take ESG more serious. Because that is, of course, still the largest economy, largest capital market. So if we globally want to make progress, the U.S. has to do its part. Okay, fantastic. Michael, in one sentence. Biggest, biggest challenges? I think there are two. Um, one is, um, we, we've alluded to that already, is impact measurement. I think uh, there needs to be much more work done in terms of how we measure impact. Because only then we will achieve results in... In, uh, in the real economy. Um, it doesn't help to just um, divest or imp you know, minimize your CO2 footprint of the portfolio. Nothing has changed when you do so um, in terms of the output of uh, CO2 emissions. So we ought to think about what is, what is the, um, the impact measurement, the right one. And then secondly, it is exactly on the climate, um, uh, climate change front, on the climate risks, that we face um, a big funding gap. Um, the EU Commission 
um, for, for Europe alone has um, come out with a number of 180 billion euros per year that is needed to, in terms of investments to actually um, achieve the, 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 clou the, the Paris uh, climate goals. So I think that is, that is something that um, we haven't managed to mobilize yet, that capital, and we are all asked, I think, to, to find ways how to do it and to measure then the impact. It's more than a sentence, but I'll let you off because that's a good point. Um, Hero, op opportunities and challenges for the next year? <coughs> I think that <coughs> we came to realize they are not only asset owner, asset manager who actually consists of this investment chain. So we now started engaging with the index vendors and a proxy advisors. Those people play a significant and very important role to make the investment chain more sustainable. So uh, we have very short, you know, the uh, stuffed and uh, trying to engage with all the different you know, parties is, gives us a challenge. And the second is obviously performance. You know, the in, traditional investment team perfor uh, performance is measured by traditional, like a, you know, benchmark or like a, you know, short term like return. So we need to change it to reinforce alignment between investment team and the ESG initiatives. Okay, fantastic. Michael, really one sentence because I'm getting shouted at here. Sorry, no, um, Stefan, sorry. Sure. Um, I think there are ongoing commitments. Um, so using very pragmatically simple and consistent language around ESG, we use a lot of acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> People get confused. Try to have a very consistent and simple speak to our client. Make it clear what it is and what it isn't. Uh, and then uh, uh, also the performance piece is important. You know, many of the ESG factors are not priced in yet or there's little evidence. So convince our clients important mm -hmm. to look at climate change risk because it may not be there in the next quarter, but maybe coming forward very quickly. Uh, third thing, we have a responsibility as active asset managers to contribute as big asset allocators on behalf of our clients to a sustainable finance system. So I think that is something we need to continue to think around how we can deliver solutions and contribute to that piece. We all know and forgot quickly about 08. We all know and forgot quickly about the European Monetary Union crisis. All those crises popping up, bubble, uh, tech com bubble busting. So uh, I think we should be next time a bit smarter and contribute our share. Okay, thank you. Ava? Challenge is now that we all keep talking a lot about ESG, uh, I'm a bit scared that uh, it will be seen as black or white. I, I, either you're a bad or good investment or company. Let's remember that this is uh, must be able to take time. And the encouraging thing is we are going to listen to Christina Figueres, the Sustainable Development Goals. They are an opportunity for all of us in this room. Fantastic. Well, it's good to hear you all talking about climate and the SDGs, and I think that's a good segue and a great way to finish the panel. But can I thank everybody? Thank you so much.